praying. Good evening. Welcome to our Maundy Thursday Holy Week celebration. I'm delighted that you're here. It's a beautiful service, and I know that God is going to bless us during this time. This service, as many of you know, commemorates the last Passover meal that Jesus shared with his disciples and community before his betrayal, his trial, and his crucifixion. Uh, there's a schedule on the backs of your bulletin that details the balance of our Holy Week and our Easter services. I'd encourage you to take it with you, memorize it, pass it on to someone that you love or care about, and invite them to share in this uh, culmination of Holy Week as we prepare our hearts and our minds for Easter. If you're glad to be here tonight, and I absolutely know you are because you're here, would you stand and greet one another with the peace and grace of our Lord Jesus Christ?
Please return to your worship guides and join me in the prayer of confession. Friends in Christ, in this Lenten season, we have heard the call of Jesus to struggle against sin, death, and every evil, all that keeps us from loving God and each other. Our God never wearies of offering forgiveness and giving the peace of reconciliation. On this night, let us reflect on our sins against God and our neighbor and enter the celebration of the great three days reconciled with God and with one another. Let us confess our sins against God and our neighbor. Most merciful God, we confess that we have sinned against you in thought, word, and deed by what we have done and by what we have left undone. We have not loved you with our whole heart. We have not loved our neighbors as ourselves. We are truly sorry and we humbly repent for the sake of your Son, Jesus Christ, have mercy on us and forgive us that we may delight in your will and walk in your ways to the glory of your holy name. Amen. Almighty God, have mercy on us. Forgive us all our sins through our Lord Jesus Christ. Strengthen us in all goodness and by the power of the Holy Spirit, keep us in eternal life. Amen.
Our epistle lesson comes to us from Paul's first letter to the church in Corinth. Hear these words. For I received from the Lord what I also passed on to you. The Lord Jesus, on the night he was betrayed, took bread, and when he had given thanks, he broke it and said, This is my body, which is for you. Do this in remembrance of me. In the same way, after supper, he took the cup, saying, This cup is a new covenant in my blood. Do this whenever you drink it in remembrance of me. For whenever you eat this bread and drink this cup, you proclaim the Lord's death until Christ comes. May God bless the hearing of these ancient words. Amen. Let me invite you, please, to stand for the reading of the Gospel. Hear what the Spirit is saying to the church. A reading from the Holy Gospel according to John. Now, before the festival of the Passover, Jesus knew that his hour had come to depart from this world and to go to God to he in heaven. 
Having loved his own who were in the world, he loved them to the end. The devil had already put it into the heart of Judas Iscariot to betray Jesus. And during supper, Jesus, knowing that God had given all things into his own hands and that he had come from God and was going to God, got up from the table, took off his outer robe, and tied a towel around himself. Then he poured water into a basin and began to wash the disciples' feet and to wipe them with the towel that was tied around him. When Jesus came to Simon Peter, Peter said, Lord, are you going to wash my feet? And Jesus answered, you do not know now what I am doing, but later you will understand. And Peter said to him, you will never wash my feet. And Jesus answered, unless I wash you, you have no share with me. And Peter said to him, Lord, not my feet only, but also my hands and head. And Jesus said, one who is bathed does not need to wash except for the feet, but is entirely clean. And you are clean, though not all of you. For Jesus knew who was to betray him. For this reason, he said, not all of you are clean. After Jesus had washed their feet, had put on his robe, and had returned to the table, he said to the disciples, Do you know what I have done to you? You call me teacher and Lord, and you are right, for that is what I am. So if I, your Lord and teacher, have washed your feet, you also ought to wash one another's feet. For I have set you an example that you also should do as I have done to you. Very truly, I tell you, servants are not greater than their master, nor are messengers greater than the one who sent them. If you know these things, you are blessed if you do them. I give you a new commandment, that you love one another. Just as I have loved you, you also should love one another. By this, everyone will know that you are my disciples, if you have love for one another. This is the gospel of Christ. Please be seated. Welcome to the three great days, the triduum, the most sacred days in our time together as Christians. We mark time all different sorts of ways, but in our spiritual life, we key it often to the life of Jesus. And this week is what we call our Holy Week, and these three days are the most holy of, of the Holy Week. And we look tonight at the commemoration of Jesus washing the feet of the disciples and Jesus instituting the Lord's Supper. Tomorrow, we look at his trial and crucifixion and death. And then on Saturday, we watch and we wait. And we know for certain that love is stronger than death and that resurrection will find expression in the midst of this story. These are hard stories to tell because they're so real. I have never been able to understand how we can come together as a group like this and look at these stories of great sadness and suffering and not find in them also our own life stories as well. These are true stories because we know them. We've lived them. Who here has not known betrayal, disappointment in personal relationships, or in community, who here has not found solace at this table, even in the most difficult times? Who here has not suffered in watching the suffering of a friend going through illness or death, prolonged or sudden? Who here has not longed for resurrection and new life? We come together to look at these stories sad or painful as they are, because there are stories and they're true. And the sadness and the grief is real, but the resurrection and the new life are also real. 
I've often felt that the depth of our sadness or grief is an indicator of our capacity for resurrection and joy. So tonight, we look at what we've come to call Jesus' Last Supper, or the Lord's Supper. Last Supper, it's an interesting phrase. You know, it was a phrase that came into common parlance in San Francisco in the 1980s and 90s, when there were so many people living with terminal illness, AIDS, and there was a certain trajectory a predictability to someone's illness and death, that it was not uncommon to have last suppers, intentional gatherings with someone close to the time of their death. Sometimes they might be involved in the timing of their death, sometimes not. But nevertheless, we had these intentional gatherings, and I know you had them here, too, in this city. Someone made a, Margaret Cho made a movie about it, actually a pretty terrible movie. Um, but I thought the remarkable thing was that someone made a movie about it at all, acknowledging the poignancy of gathering together with people when you know things are about to change and saying to one another what needs to be said in order for progress, a letting go, a kind of resurrection to take place. It wasn't always possible, but when it did happen, it was always powerful. And that's what I know, that's how I know this story was powerful. Jesus understood that things were about to change. He'd done a lot of things with this group of people. They'd worked together and achieved many of their goals, many exciting life transformations, changes in society were visible as a result of their work together. You could measure the success of a change movement by the amount of resistance it engenders. And Jesus, according to John's gospel, the one we've been using this season, was going to be arrested certainly, and particularly for his crime of raising Lazarus. This is what the religious authorities decided was the final straw. He's giving too much hope that the way things are can't be, can be changed. And so Jesus' arrest was certain. He knew. And those surrounding him probably knew. But sometimes they would perhaps do what we do too, allow themselves to acknowledge and other times pretend it wasn't happening at all. Jesus was very focused. He comes into his own in this week and we see why he was a great leader. He called them together, and it's clear to him that they need to do a reset, and that it will no longer be the way it had been. But he does not leave them without resources for this time of change that is about to take place. He says to them, I'm going to show you something that will be really valuable to you as you renew your community after I am no longer with you. And then Jesus models this servant leadership. Jesus doesn't call them together to say, you know what, I'm leaving. Let's make a big fuss about me. Jesus calls them together to say, look, and one by one, in a very intimate way, he washes their feet. And this would have been as intimate then as it sounds today. If you don't think it's intimate, I know how hard it was to find 12 people who were willing, with warning, to come and allow their feet to be washed in public by the clergy. There are many ways we could have reenacted this ceremony. That's how we're doing it this year. 12 representatives of the congregation whose feet are being washed by the clergy. And even the clergy said, well, I think it's rather easier to wash someone's feet in public than to allow my own feet to be washed. That's true. So wherever in this story you find resistance 
or you think, I don't think I'd like to do that, push yourself there and ask yourself why. Jesus is very clear. Leadership means equality, an egalitarian model where no one is greater than another, and that as you reset your community, experimenting with non-hierarchical manners of organizing yourselves, this is Jesus to the disciples, but could be to us. This is how you will find what you need to do in order to achieve what you long for. Jesus knew that what they had achieved together was far too important to be personality dependent on him or on any other charismatic personality. He pushed them to find the place where they could feel equal to each other, not identical to one another, but equal to each other, appreciate each other. And so he had them engage in this ritual which still has meaning to us 2,000 years later, taking off their, sh their, here people will take off their shoes and socks and others who are leaders of a sort will wash their feet. And you have a role too. Place yourself in the stead of the person whose foot is being washed or place yourself in the stead of the person who's washing. And imagine what it is about leadership and spirituality that Jesus is speaking to you and to us tonight. It is a very intimate gesture. You can't wash someone's feet and never forget it. Anyone who's ever been reliant upon another person during illness and had to surrender certain notions of modesty in order to survive, do you know what I'm talking about? You understand how intimate this is. Jesus said, at the core of our movement, if it stands for anything, it stands for this, leaders who are servants to one another. And he said that, conscious that it was an imperfect group that he was working with. I'm sure you caught the allusion to Judas when he said, and not all of you are being perfectly honest here. That's what community is like. Not everyone's always going to be operating 100% all the time. Jesus understood that and said to them, still persist. Remember, no one is better than another. No one is higher than another. You equally contribute to this movement, and that's what makes it strong. It's not about me. It's not about her or him. It's about us. And so Jesus washed their feet. And then he did something else. He shared with them a meal they were accustomed to sharing maybe all the time, but it took on new meaning that night. During the Passover, according to some, their liberation meal, when they gathered at least once a year as a people to remind themselves where they had come from in slavery and oppression and where they were going to liberation and freedom. In the midst of that meal, he gave a sign to them. This bread, it's my body. This cup, it's my blood. Another intimate gesture, another kind of identification, another pledge to them that he would always be with them, if not in body and spirit, and present to them in the table. For Jesus, resurrection was not the goal. It was the process. And Eucharist and servant leadership were the strategies that made it possible. Not only are you all equal, but whenever you gather, Jesus said to them, break bread and share a cup and know that I'm with you. I won't be with you in the same way after this week, but you still have work to do. Jesus offers to us 
this model as we as a whole community go through a reset, a communal resurrection. Jesus models the kind of leadership we can expect from our, our leaders and from one another. And Jesus also reminds us of the importance of the centrality of the table in our spiritual lives. There is nothing we can't go through without the presence of Christ to sustain us as represented by the bread and the cup, especially if we make it a discipline to gather here every week, no matter what, even if we're mad at each other, or even if someone has betrayed us or disappointed us. I wouldn't dream of missing my weekly reunion moment with Jesus, with the saints and angels, and with all my brothers and sisters, perfect and imperfect, because we receive here at this table what we need most in order to experience resurrection. Tonight, I invite you to either go back to that upper room in your mind, we'll bring that upper room into this place, whichever works better for you. Is there someone who has betrayed you that you need to seek reconciliation with? Maybe you can't do it tonight, but it could begin tonight by acknowledging it. There's no safer place in the world to acknowledge to yourself if there's a reconciliation that you need, that you need, that they need, that needs, the world needs, that love needs. Can you pledge tonight together to the kind of leadership that we're about to experiment with with foot washing. And will you agree to continue to meet in this place as often as possible for Jesus' encouragement as we go together on the road to resurrection? Amen. I want to ask our congregational leaders to come forward and to take their places here.
I would like to thank those who represent all of us today by having their feet washed, by humbling themselves and receiving this blessing and this gift. It reminds me of the scriptures that talk about how we're to humble ourselves before God and that God will lift us up. So whether it's having our feet washed, giving an offering, making a sacrifice to be here and rehearse many, many services for this week, we're called to bring a sacrifice of ourselves, to give ourselves away. So as our ushers come forward this evening, I thank you for your generosity. Your gifts make a difference. As Jim said a moment ago, we're equal. In the realm of God, it's not about how much you give. It's about the heart with which you give it. And so give with your heart, give with praise, give with thanksgiving, and let's watch together what God does in our midst. Amen.
as our lay ministers of worship come forward to prepare a place for you. It's my honor and privilege as always to remind you that this feast, this banquet, is for everyone here. There are no exceptions. We come together to eat and drink and remember and most of all experience the love of God for everyone. Come forward, please, as the ushers direct you.
Let us pray. Almighty God, whose dear Son, on the night before he suffered, instituted the sacrament of his body and blood, mercifully grant that we may receive it thankfully in remembrance of Jesus Christ, our Lord, who in these holy mysteries gives us a pledge of eternal life and who now lives and reigns with you and the Holy Spirit, one God, forever and ever. Amen.